Good. Good morning. It's good to be with you all. If you can't hear me at any point, if I begin to mumble, please let me know and give me one of these kind of things. Um, I'm typically not a mumbler because I always accuse my husband of being a mumbler. Um, it's not my problem, it's his. Um, my name is Matt Llewellyn Otten, and I work as the Associate Director of Religious Organizing at Outfront Minnesota. Um, a little bit about Outfront is Outfront Minnesota's mission is to create a state where, li actually, I should ask, how much time do I have? Oh, Lord, don't even get me started. I grew up in the South, and like the Baptist church influence coming in, and like we just keep going. Um, so I'm going to give myself about 45 minutes and then 15 minutes for questions. Okay. Um, Outfront's Minnesota's mission is to create a state where lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer people are free to be who they are, love who they love, and live without fear of violence, harassment, or discrimination. And we envision a state where LGBTQIA individuals have equal opportunities, protections, and rights. And we're working toward a day when all Minnesotans have the freedom, power, and confidence to make the best choices for their own lives. Um, I think mission and vision statements are very cute. Um, they give you a good idea of what they are, but like, what are you actually doing, right? That's the, that's, that's the ultimate question. We're working towards queer liberation, is how I like to define it. And how we work towards that is three main departments within our organization. The first being our anti-violence program. If you're experiencing any type of violence within your life, you can call this 800 number, 800-800-0350, and you can talk with somebody. We have a trained social worker on our staff um, who's able to talk with you. We're able to get resources. Anybody who's experiencing some type of crisis within their life. Um, second, we have education equity. They work with our, this department works with school boards, um, they work with uh, staff and faculty, and they even work with students to make more equitable schools and more equitable school districts in the state of Minnesota. And we also just had our big um, youth summit, so it was schools and youth school districts from um, around Minnesota that came to St. Paul and there was just, they got to learn about being queer students and it was really cool. Um, and then we have the most important department, which is the department that I work in, policy and organizing. Um, so we work with legislators, but we also work with individuals to mobilize them in important moments in the queer, in the movement towards queer liberation. And I work specifically with congregations across our state as the religious organizer. And my little clicker is going the wrong way, so. I'm just gonna step towards it and keep going. All right, it's not that I, um, it's not that I don't care who's in the room. I, I just want to talk about me more. <laughs> um, so my name is Matt Llewellyn Otten. I use they and he pronouns. Um, I'm a former youth minister. I know I give off youth minister vibes. It's who I am. I embrace it. It's just. I just go with it. I know that's who I am. Um, like I said, I'm from the South, um, but Minnesota is home. I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, I've been in Minnesota for five years, and this is my first time in Northfield, which I feel like is a sin. Um, so it's really good to be here. What's that? Because this is only my first time here. Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. Thank you. Um, I grew up in the church. Um, I grew up in the Presbyterian church. And um, growing up in, in a, a, a small kind of... I lived in a suburb of Charleston as a little queer kid. That was a little hard. Um, and um, it wasn't an easy process for coming out. And it's still hard to go visit there. And um, one day I heard from the pulpit at a church that my now husband and I were going to, we were attending, and they said from the pulpit, um, boys don't sleep with other boys. And we kind of looked at each other and we were like, well, yeah, they do. And so 
we saw at that moment this was not a place where we were welcome. And so um, we went church shopping, and we went to an Episcopal church. That wasn't our thing. And then we stepped into um, Circular Congregational Church, which is a UCC church in Charleston, South Carolina. And it was the first time that I heard from the pulpit that no matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. Gay, straight, it doesn't matter. It was the first time that I heard from a pulpit that me as a whole human being was welcome in that space. And it was liberating. And I had been in youth ministry before that. I had spent um, my first job out of college was at doing youth ministry. And um, I was kicked out of that job after I came out. And so it was really good to hear that again. And then that led me to doing more youth ministry at this church, which then led me to seminary. And then, you know, just all of the things. And no, I'm not ordained, um, but I do know enough to be dangerous, is how I like to put it. Um, I love working for Outfront. This is kind of the dream job for me of being able to bring in some of my nonprofit background, being able to bring in my divinity degree, and being able to bring in my, my whole self. So um, it's an honor to be here with you all. Um, I'm a lover of coffee, candy, and the Oxford comma. I'm a firm believer in the Oxford comma because you have, you have steak, eggs, and orange juice, not eggs and orange juice together because that'd be disgusting. Anyway, um, and that's my husband right there up in the left corner. And I need to update this picture. I didn't realize that I didn't update while I was looking at these slides. But um, that dog's dead. <laughs> so, <laughs> we do have another dog now, though. That dog is no longer with us. But that's Cooper. Um, I, I can laugh about it. Now. Um, so a little bit of my work as a religious organizer, just really quickly, I connect with people across the state, um, building relationships with lay leaders, congregational leaders, um, pieces of, like governments of churches and those type of things. Um, I hope to, to spur people towards collective action at the Capitol too. We had a lot of clergy, ordained clergy at the Capitol this past week with, um, well, Friday with the passage of the trans refuge bill and the conversion therapy ban bill. And so I believe that people of faith are in a, um, a unique and significant position in order to shift the hearts and minds of, the, of Minnesotans and legislators uh, while we're also creating policy change at a state level. Um, I work with coalitions. A lot of my work revolves around fighting white Christian supremacy and the ways that it shows up within Christianity. And so a lot of my work revolves around that. And then it also revolves around creating affirming spaces within churches. How can we go from just welcoming to affirming and how can we continue to learn more about the LGBTQ plus community? Um, no. Terms and definitions, we're gonna go over some terms and definitions, but I want us to go a little bit beyond that. I'm not gonna to spend too much time on some basic terms. We're gonna get into some more nitty gritty stuff. So you may have seen LGBTQ, right? Uh, um, excuse me. Lesbian, a woman who is emotionally, romantically, or sexually attracted to other women. Women and non-binary people may use this term to describe themselves. Non-binary may be a new word for you, but hold on to that word in your brain. We will come back to it, I promise. Gay, a person who is emotionally, romantically, or sexually attracted to members of the same gender. Men, women, and non-binary people may use this term to describe themselves. It's, gay is often used as an umbrella term. So. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that sometimes these terms can be used as a term of empowerment, but they can also be used derogatorily. Bisexual, an individual who is emotionally, physically, and or sexually attracted to multiple sexes or genders. Trans, a term for people whose gender identity does not match their sex assigned at birth. We'll get back to that phrase, sex assigned at birth, too. And then queer. Some people may flinch when they hear this word, right? Yes, 
Um, it's often used as an umbrella term to describe anyone who is not heterosexual or cisgender. Cisgender is a person who does align with the gender identity of the sex that they were assigned at birth um, or the community as a whole. So to talk a little bit about that flinching whenever you hear the word queer, right? Um, queer has been used as a term of, um, in its history, has been used as a term to denigrate LGBTQ people. But now there's a whole generation of young people who ha are hearing this term as a term of empowerment for them. They don't know anything about it being derogatorily used. They are now feeling, seeing it as a word to describe themselves that goes beyond the normal, the old ways of describing gay, lesbian, bisexual. Queerness now is being embraced as a term to kind of encompass the full spectrum of sexuality, of gender expression, of gender. So there's a whole generation of young people that don't know what this term, the history of this term, but some people do. And sometimes we can bring words into question, right? It helps us kind of evolve the ways that we think about words. I identify as queer because um, I see it as a way for me to express my I find it to be a better term to describe who I am as a non-binary person, as a, as a person who is attracted to men, sometimes women, um, you know, non-binary people. So I use it as a term to describe myself. Um, but there's another cue in there that we like to keep in the LGBTQ um, alphabet here, and it's questioning a term used to describe people who are in the process of exploring their sexual orientation or gender identity. It's a process, too. We see old and younger people kind of going through this process. This might be a new term for you, intersex. Um, intersex people are born with a variety of differences in their sex traits and reproductive anatomy, including differences in genitalia, chromosomes, gonads, internal sex hormones, uh, hormone production, hormone response, and or secondary sex traits. Intersex um, is a new term that we use. We no longer use the word hermaphrodite, right? There's a, there's a long history of the term of intersex and how it's been used and correctional, surgery, correctional surgeries around intersex people. But this is kind of a newer term, but it has been in academia and, uh, and probably until around the 50s, since the 50s, and now it's become um, a word that's used more. Asexual refers to a complete or partial lack of sexual attraction or lack of interest in sexual activity with others. Asexuality exists on a spectrum, and asexual people may experience no, little, or conditional sexual attraction. So it might be that they're not interested in sex. That's not a, a factor in relationship building. Um, but that doesn't mean they're aromantic, right? That doesn't mean that they don't want to have some form of connection with another person. Um, but it also can exist on a spectrum. Maybe there's certain things in order for them to be sexually attracted to somebody that have to be in place in order for them to feel comfortable to be sexually attracted to somebody. Um, I've had people in trainings that I've like, given them this term and they're like, oh no, I'm, I might be queer, right? <laughs> so like, there's, a, there's something that happens with people and they're like, oh, I, I'm, I think I'm asexual. Um, I like to include two spirit here as well. It refers to a person who has both a masculine and a feminine spirit. It is used by somebody, um, by some people indigenous to Turtle Island or North America um, to describe their sexual gender or spiritual identity. It's an umbrella term that may encompass same sex attraction and a wide variety of gender variances. This is a term specific to Native Americans and specific Native American communities, right? It's not a term to be um, co-opted by whiteness. It is very specific 
two-spirited people have been venerated within indigenous communities forever. There are accounts of um, Ozawindib in Leech Lake area, and account that they're colonial accounts, of course, so it's like all these French and English people looking in and observing the, 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 um, the practices of this community, right? But there are um, real accounts of a real two-spirited person here in Minnesota around Leech Lake, and I think it's so fun to kind of think about that. There's a great book, I don't know if you've ever heard of this book, it's called Land of 10,000 Loves and it's a queer history of Minnesota. And so you can just like pick it up every so often. They have like short little blurbs in there about the queer history of places. And it's really cool to just kind of pick up on, um, from your coffee um, table and just kind of learn a little bit of queer history every so often. Um, you can find it everywhere. Um, and then we have the plus, which is my favorite part. Um, the plus is used to signify the ever-growing list of gender identities and orientations that aren't represented in the rest of these letters. We like to leave room to learn, to grow, to think a little bit more. So when we're talking about sexual orientation, there's many ways that people identify their sexual orientations. Um, it's a spectrum that encompasses many different ways of feeling attraction to somebody else, and maybe sexual or romantic. But the key to understanding all of this about identity, um, orientation, gender identity, um, these labels exist in order for us to feel comfortable in defining ourselves, in finding community with one another, and very specific needs that are necessary for queer people um, in finding um, holistic health care, uh, in finding um, communities, places of community, and places of welcome and affirmation for them. These are really important terms, um, but they also exist in relationship. I think the key to understanding all of this is to be in relationship with queer people and journey along with them. We'll get into that a little bit more, too. So I talked about this, sex assigned at birth. Um, this is a term that we're trying to get in our lexicon a little bit more. So sex is a category assigned to each of us um, at birth, and it's based almost always on the appearance of external anatomy. So components include chromosomes, genitalia, hormones, internal reproductive organs, secondary sex characteristics. Um, so this is when I was born, they, I came out of my mother and they said, it's a boy, right? They assigned a sex to me. They didn't assign a gender. They assigned a sex to me. And we like to say sex assigned at birth because we don't want to say, well, they used to be this and now they're this, right? It's a journey. It's a way of discovering ourselves. The sex assigned at birth for me is male, right? That doesn't define my gender. My gender is non-binary. I've, I've always, um, like I said, growing up as a little gay kid in the South was pretty hard. I never felt like I um, fit in with the boys or the girls. I never felt that I was um, either one of those things. I've always felt as if um, I might be a little bit different. I don't fit into this gender binary that we've created within our society of men and women. You go here and you go here. We love binaries in our society. We love not to think of gray areas. And so often when I'm thinking of my own faith and my own faith journey, there's a lot of gray areas. So how can we continue to lean into those gray areas even to binary distinctions of gender? I'll talk a little bit more about this. Okay, so the big question that people ask is like, okay, but so we have gender, all right, but then like sex can only be two things, right? So the, often the argument is like, God created man and woman, right? Blah, 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 blah. And, but intersex people kind of begin to bring this into deep questioning, right? Because when we look at the experiences of intersex people, 
they're born with a variety of, of differences that we see as so distinct for males and females. So this, herm, this term hermaphrodite, there's a long history of this word. Um, and I'm going to follow up with an email with Kathy about some resources for y'all. There's some great resources even on YouTube that talk about the like, history of the word intersex and what intersex is. I don't have a lot of time to go really deep into it, but it brings into question the idea that people are just created two distinct ways. The experience of intersex people shows us that we're not just created two distinct ways. It shows us that this sex binary that we've created doesn't exist. It never existed within the world. Don't play the video, shh. Okay, so activity. I promise this won't be hard. Okay, I love to use this because it just kind of helps us to think really deeply about some questions. And I just want you to take a moment. I'm gonna read these questions, let you reflect a moment, and then you can share with a neighbor if you want to. I'll give you like three minutes to share with a neighbor. It's gonna be fast, I promise. So the first question, how do you know what gender you are? Think about that for a moment. Can you describe your gender? Yes, yeah. Oh, don't beat me to the point. <laughs> Just stick with the question, please. Put your hand down, no more questions from you. <laughs> Do not jump the gun on me. Y'all are too smart for my tricks. When did you first become aware of your gender? Gender is the, the way that you express how you feel. Your gender is like how we think about the ways that we move about our society in kind of this, I was talking about this binary kind of way, but I'm, we're gonna get there, I promise. Okay, great. <laughs> um, how have your family and friends responded to your gender expression? Gender expression is the ways that you express your gender. The clothes that you wear, the way that you talk, the, the things that you might be interested in, if you wear a hat or not, what kind of hats you wear. What do you really like about your gender? And then what would you change about your gender or other people's perception of your gender? All right, take a moment. Discuss a question or two with a neighbor, and then we'll come back together. So I'm gonna give you like th three minutes maybe, just so I can breathe for a second. All right, about 90 more seconds. About 45 more seconds. Final thoughts.
All right, last sentence. All right, time for sharing with the larger group. And you can raise your hand and I'll call on you. I'll take one or two responses from each one. Um, which question was the easiest to answer and why? Oh, I love it. So you said, screw the way that you're teaching me, Matt. Throw it out the window. I'm doing my own thing. I like it. I respect it. <laughs> what came up? Yeah. Yes, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize there were Zoomers. Okay. Um, we had Joan and you don't have, Elizabeth talking a little bit about where's the, where's my camera? Oh, love it. Um, <laughs> um, okay, there's one there. Hey. Um, they were talking a little bit about how um, reflecting a little bit about gender and the way that it came up in the home and um, you know in, in their home it was like whoever was the biggest and the strongest was mowing the lawn that day or picking or taking out the garbage or yes Elizabeth out yeah Yes, so task fulfillment within the community rather than assigning gender. Great. Thanks for not doing anything that I asked you to do and having a great discussion. I appreciate it. So can anybody ask, answer the question, which one was the easiest to answer and why? And I will pass you the mic and don't be intimidated by a microphone. It's just so everybody can hear. I'm going to run to you. Which was the easiest to answer and why? Having grown up with two older brothers, I felt as though uh, I could do everything they did as a child. And uh, an early memory of that not being true was that my older brothers would dress outside in the summer by not wearing a shirt and wearing a pair of shorts. And I didn't understand why I couldn't do that. So I felt that much of my initial identity or behavior was clearly affected by um, I was not a boy. Clearly affected that way. So my gender identity uh, all along, I had to fight that. Is that gender identity? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, which question was the hardest to answer and why? Anybody would like to share? Would you like to share? <laughs> <laughs> You're never too old. <laughs> Which is the hardest to answer and why? Would anybody like to share? Oh, we have a second mic. Thank you. <gasps> She's coming. No. Oh. Try again. Hello. Yeah. All right, it's on. So there's a second mic. So here I am in the back of the room. Thank you. Your camera's there, probably. Um, yeah. I think they were all hard to answer because you have to almost get through the first one before you can answer the rest. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, now that we're identified 
or uh, sex assigned at birth, then, but I was always considered a tomboy growing up, so what do I do with that? Although it was things I loved to do, but I was still a girl, uh, didn't like dresses very much, didn't like all the things that were associated with that, or many of them, but, so I, I think it's a really hard, all of them I think are hard questions. But I can say what my family thought about it, you know, and, and they're pushing for me being a girly girl. But otherwise, it's a hard question. Thank you for your reflections. I appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, when I think about this, I um, probably the like emotionally hardest question to answer and why is people responding to my gender expression, right? It, it was really pushed upon me as a child that I had to play with certain toys and all I wanted to do was play with Barbies. And, and I was limited to the number of Barbies I was allowed to have, right? So, like, so it wouldn't make me too gay, right? So it, it wouldn't make me too effeminate. So I was allowed to have two girl Barbies and one Ken. But I could have G.I. Joes. So that was very confusing. I would just play with the G.I. Joes and the Barbies together and put the G.I. Joes in the Barbie clothes. <laughs> so like, it was very, very confusing. Um, but yeah, I mean like one time I really wanted a Barbie Jeep for my birthday, like a pink Barbie Jeep for my Barbies to ride around in, right? And um, my parents I, I opened up a, you know, birthdays weren't huge in our house, but you know, I opened up a few gifts and it wasn't there. And then my grandmother shows up with a gift and it's my Barbie Jeep. And my grandmother, Nina, coming in clutch. That's what we call her, Nina. She just turned 90 this year. And she um, was the first person to, to respond really positively when I first came out. The first person to kind of champion for me. It was really amazing. Um, what came up for you? Anybody want to reflect a little bit? What came up? I saw, okay, there we go, we got a hand. Uh, <clears throat> I was, uh, the only one of these that I had anything to say about at all was the last one. And because I've, you know, I've been female all my life and have never had any, uh, you know, that's always fit well for me. But misogyny is alive and well in our culture and it just irritates me that the expectation is that I'm the female, so I'm gonna be the touchy-feely one in our family, and Steve is the male, so he's gonna be the strong, logical one in our family. Well, not so much. Yeah. And, <laughs> so that kind of continuing expectation based on gender, uh, especially around emotional work, um, um, stuff in the workplace has gotten better. It's not perfect yet, but it's gotten better over my lifetime um, but there's still a lot of misogyny out there yes thank you so much has anybody ever been asked these questions oh sorry do you want to share a reflection please um, are you making your way to him just on that same point I think at least the way I think about it there's a difference between how I conceive of my own gender and how I perceive role expectations, so I would describe the difference between being male and being masculine, and maybe the difference between being female and being feminine. And, and that difference has never been comfortable for me. I'm not liking most of what I find as social definitions of ultra-masculine, and I think the same thing if I were female. I'd probably have the same issues with definitions of feminine. But it has never confused me about being male. So I don't know what that means, but that's my own struggle. It sounds some great deep thinking about the ways that masculinity shows up within our culture and how we define masculinity and how we describe how we define de femininity within our culture. It sounds like you're bringing in some good questions about that and some good ruminations. Thank you. Anybody else want to share? Yeah, I got it. I think for girls particularly it there's a lot around presentation of who you are when you're out in public. Because we ran around like wild things at home and all played together, but on Sunday or school days, it was a dress, it was clean white socks. It, so how you present yourself in public is, was a big deal. Yeah, and I think that still exists of the ways, 
there's like a double standard for the ways that female presenting people can are allowed to show up within a specific yeah they do but i will say that like there's there's you know there's this whole thing of like well what was she wearing when she was assaulted right well what was she wearing in which that's the question Oh, and she might have had a drink, right, exactly. So like, mm-hmm, you can't live your life, you can't just, it's, it's, it's still female blame, and the blame is still like what they were wearing. Did you have a reflection? I'd like to say that I've seen a huge difference developing across my family. Um, my mother lived to 101 years old, and up to the very end was disappointed in me for not wearing makeup or dressing appropriately. But my grandson, from the time he was three and could express it, knew that um, he wanted to have pink clothes and he wanted to be a princess for Halloween and he wanted to play with the girls because they were nicer to him. And his sense of style, he's now a going off to college, um, his sense of style is so wonderful and such a blend of, of his personality and, um, and his desire to be a gay man and the acceptance that he finds from friends and family and community just delights me. So I think we're making progress. I think so, you know, I think so too. Yeah, one final reflection. Well, when I went into appliance repair, I was the only female. And going to somebody's house and repairing it, it's like, well, what do you think you're going to do, you know? Oh. And um, I remember repairing somebody's dryer, and the man pulled up a chair and sat there and watched me because he didn't think that I knew what I was doing. Uh, but just the, the connotation, you're a woman, you can't do this. Thank you. I really, really appreciate your reflections here. I think we learn about our experiences when we're able to process them together. So we're going to talk a little bit about what gender is. So it's not as easy. We're getting there. Gender is not as easy as you might think, right? Of course. So gender identity, I talked about this, is an in -pers a person's internal sense of themselves as a man, a woman, both or neither, and oftentimes it's influenced heavily by their sex assigned at birth, right? So this is where the idea of non-binary comes in, not living within those binaries, non-binary, not living within those binaries that were assigned to us at birth or that society is trying to define upon us. Under this gender umbrella, we have transgender, a term for people whose identity differs from the sex that they were assigned at birth. Cisgender, this isn't a bad term. You might have heard me say this already. Cis or cisgender, this isn't a slur, I promise you. Some people are like, ooh, they called me cis. It just means a term for people whose gender identity matches the sex that they were assigned at birth. So, so um, I'm hearing some mumblings of like, is that the first time some people are hearing that for the first time? Or like hearing that it's not a curse, right? And like, okay. Um, Non-binary, a term for people who may identify as being both a man, a woman, somewhere in between, or falling completely outside of these categories. While many also identify as transgender, not all non-binary people do. Non-binary can also be used as an umbrella term encompassing identities such as agender, bigender, genderqueer, gender fluid. These are a lot of other terms kind of under this non-binary umbrella. I encourage you to look those terms up and think a little bit more deeply about them. I'm not going to be able to jump into all of them right now. Yes. It's not the same. No, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, can you say that question again into the microphone, though? I'm show my ignorance? No, you're not showing your ignorance. I just went... The... So the question is, yeah. the term transgender, is that equivalent to the old homosexual versus cisgender being heterosexual? No. So, um, 
heterosexual is just a person who um, identifies as male who might be, you know, attracted to a female or a female attracted to a male. So like heterosexual, not queer at all, like doesn't fall within there. Cisgender, cis and gender have to do with gender, not about sexuality. Two distinct things. Sexuality and gender are two very different things. So like my gender is non-binary, but um, so I use the word term queer to describe myself. Um, so my gender is non-binary, not fitting within this, these definitions of man or woman of our society. Um, but I am homosexual. I'm attracted to masculine presenting people. Like that's, that's who I'm primarily partnered, that's who I'm partnered with, right? That's my partner. We are in a monogamous relationship. We have been for too, too, many, too many years. So like we've been together for 12 years. This is our relationship. This is who I'm attracted to. Um, so heterosexual, homosexual, that has to do with sexuality. Question. No, I was just gonna make a comment maybe for Gary's benefit, but for benefit of others. I am a fairly cisgendered, but le leaning a little queer <laughs> every day, um, cisgendered lesbian. So you, you know me, you know my relationship. Um, so if that's helpful, that is how I would identify in this framework. Yeah, so like my husband uses he, him pronouns, has never thought that he's trans in any way, um, cisgender, but he's attracted to me, who's pretty masculine presenting, and but has been on this queer journey for a long time of bringing things into perspective. Yeah. I'm sorry, this is just a, a little point of clarification and it might help. I, I, I'm wondering if what he was really asking is, are they parallel terms? Heterosexual, homosexual, we understand those. Those are kind of we're, are more familiar to us. Can we think of trans and cis in the same way as parallel terms about gender identity rather than about sexual orientation? And I think if that's what you're asking, that makes sense. Yes, they're about different things, yes, they're about different things but they're parallel terms. I'll give it to you. Um, so breaking it down a little bit more, we have a trans umbrella here. So um, on the two sides of the handle of our umbrella, we have binary, right? Um, trans man, trans woman, and we have non-binary, <clears throat> trans non-binary people, and they fit under this trans umbrella. You have um, words like agender, demi boy, demi girl, demi gender, gender flux, androgyny, tri gender, pan gender, two spirit kind of falls under this. I know you're feeling overwhelmed and that's okay to feel overwhelmed. I want us to lean into the fear a little bit, right? I want us to lean into it and think about it. Do a little bit of research, think a little bit more about it, H ask good questions. So transgender people may sometimes change their names, their pronouns, take hormones, or surgically alter their bodies, right? But none of these are required to be transgender. There's no one way to be trans. You can't define it by, it's the way that people are. You can't define it just by one thing that people are doing, right? It's a part of their identity. It's who they are, it's how they feel. Um, so then you talk, there's this question of like, but there's only two genders, right? So um, I like to reflect upon the, the definition uh, that the World Health Organization uh, gives when it talks about gender. It says that these are the socially constructed norms and behaviors that, that present themselves within society from person to person. And it varies from society to society, and it can be changed. We've seen the way that gender has changed even within our lifetimes, right? We reflected upon that already as a group. So when I think about gender, this is supposed to be like pinkish. I need to change this so it shows up a little bit better. Um, I like to think a little bit more of it as like a blob. Right? We can move in and out of the ways that gender shows up and people are able to move within this gender kind of blob. We can move, we can be a gender, right, without gender. 
um, but we can be mas- we can present ourselves as masculine. We might be um, masculine gender fluid, right? Or we might be feminine gender fluid or trans femme, right? There's, there's a way that we can kind of move through all of these things. So the way that gender is most obvious, right, is the way that it's expressed. Gender expression refers to the way in which a person acts to communicate their gender within a given culture. Cultural context is always important when it comes to gender to gender. It may be communicated through one's name, pronouns, clothing, haircut, behaviors, mannerisms, and there's no one way to look a certain gender or identity. Um, I'll talk a little bit about gender affirmation. So you may have heard gender transition or gender affirmation, and it's this process of coming to recognize, accept, and express one's gender identity. It's a journey that involves themselves, but because gender is expressed within our culture, there's gender expression, there's some community aspects to it as well. Most often refers to a period when a person changes things that others can see. Appearance, name, gender presentation, and involves social, medical, or legal components. Social being saying a new name to somebody. That also could be legal in changing their documents. and medical could be taking hormones of some sort. Um, we talk, there's a lot of talk about puberty blockers within um, the news right now. So transitioning can greatly improve a person's mental health and general well-being. And there's multiple ways to affirm somebody's gender, that somebody goes through this process of affirming somebody's gender. They don't have to follow a step-by-step thing. So why is this important? Um, Forcing transgender people to fit within the sex or gender roles that they were assigned at birth causes substantial psychological pain and is medically unethical. These serious health risks are reversed, specifically when transgender students are allowed to socially transition in a way that are consistent with their gender identity, and they receive support from family, schools, peers, and their community, their faith communities. This is an outdated term. It's gender incongruence is what it's called now. Somebody who's kind of going through this process of transitioning, they call it gender incongruence instead of dysphoria. It sounds really dark, right? Dysphoria. Um, It's called, there's an incongruence between the sex that they were assigned at birth and their gender identity. So it's called gender incongruence now. So, um, (laughs) I don't have enough time, but I want to talk a little bit about queer theology, but I think um, this is a great, like diving into queer theology book. Um, It's basically like a big, 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 I skipped there, a bibliography of some queer theology, and it's it's kind of, it's a good overview. So Patrick Chang is a queer theologian, and it dives really deeply into it, and you can begin to think a little bit more about the ways that gender and sexuality have influenced theology, and begin to deconstruct a little bit. Um... It's mostly about affirming people's um, experiences, especially with gender and sexuality, and building a theology um, that um, takes a new perspective on what has been used as a tool for damnation into something that is liberating and helpful for queer people. Um, A lot of queer theology is based upon this idea of the imago dei, right? So we have in the chapters, in the first couple chapters of Genesis, this this idea of the image of God, the imago dei. And it tells us that we are all made good in the image of a living God. Um, All God's creatures are mirrors of God's glory. This idea that we are all created good. Genesis 1 reflects upon this, and it's typically the... Um, the basis for a lot of queer theology. I love sharing this cartoon here. 
you have an image of what you can assume to be Jesus, and the artist is saying, this is Jesus, and there's a flock of sheep over here to the left. And the flock of sheep is looking at Jesus, and the flock of sheep says, whoa, 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 hold it right here. She wasn't lost, we kicked her out. And Jesus is holding a sheep across his back who has a trans flag painted on them and says, I know, and I found them. And it's beautiful because you have the image of Jesus coming after the lost sheep, right? But more than that, Jesus is using the right gender terms for the sheep, saying them. They're saying she, and Jesus is saying them, right? Jesus is bringing people back into the flock. Um, there's this great um, theologian, Virginia Mollencott, um, the church must let go of an inaccurate and unjust binary gender constructed that does not allow room for a Christ himself who is also Christ herself. When we're talking a lot about the body of Christ, we can think about the body of Christ as trans, including all genders, all sexualities, as the body of Christ. Elizabeth Stewart, I'm going to leave you with this quote. I wanted to say more, but maybe there'll be a part three, right? Jesus is a male born of no male matter. As such, Jesus crosses traditional boundaries about what it means to be chromosomally male. Born, a male born of no male matter, if we think about the immaculate conception of what that is telling us. Taking a spin on some queering the Bible, bringing it into question, allowing us to see differences, things that may not have been there at first look, to bring into deep question those things that we thought were so solid and bringing into that gray area. Jesus is a male born of no male matter. And then we have Jesus, Jesus um, dissolving boundaries of divine, Emmanuel, God with us. It was thought Jesus was, God was up here, right? Jesus, if we think about the theology of Jesus with us, Emmanuel, God with us. Society, going into the temple, flipping over the tables, bringing into question the ways that um, capitalism makes its way into our worship spaces. And then identity male born of no male matter. Um, I love these icons that are a collection of the ways that Jesus shows up in culture and in the Bible. Breaking the gun um, as an immigrant, covered in a rainbow, the alpha, the omega, their, their trans figuration. Last point here, why this matters. Religion has often been used to perpetuate hate against LGBTQ people, and this is called religious abuse. 57% of LGBTQ youth say that places of worship in their community are not accepting. This is from the Trevor Project. Pushing back against religious abuse. What must we do? What can we do? Remember grace. I think grace is important because we're learning. We're learning together. We're remembering that grace means inviting people in, taking a posture of humility, and allowing them to teach us as we, as we learn from them and they learn from us. Confronting religious abuse when you see it, right? That's not the Jesus I know. That's not what Jesus is telling me. Um, centering the queer person in the resolution. When conflict arises within a church, we center the queer person, the person who has been harmed deeply. We center them. 68% of LGBTQ plus youth say that they hear negative messages about being queer from religious leaders. I'm sure that that number has gone up recently with religious leaders being so prominent within the news and... Um, saying disastrous things about trans youth and trans people. My last point here, God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them, 1 John 4, 16. 
Um, I left two minutes for questions. That's all I'm leaving you. But you have a question. I'll give you a mic. Well, I failed on the first one. <laughs> You're doing great. Full disclosure, this subject is what's keeping me from being 100% liberal. And I got about a three-part question. Oh, um, the term, I think you ought to work on the term queer, because remember how we evolved with uh, Negro, colored, African American, now it's people of color, I, is that the latest? Yeah. Okay. Oh, black went in there someplace. Boy, I think, I think you need to replace or change that term or get rid, it's, I don't know, it's, it just makes my skin crawl. And then do you know what kind, of, what kind of percentages each of these letters have? Because roughly, because I'm wondering if it's high enough, maybe it's going to take care of our overpopulation problem over time. Okay. I'll reflect on the word queer first. Um, this might come a little harsh. It's not about you. Um, when I use the word queer, I think about those young people who that is a term of real empowerment for them. They don't fit within any type of this idea of I'm fully gay, I'm fully lesbian, but you know, I, I struggle even with it as a non-binary person of, of using the word gay because historically it's been used to describe a male, right? Fully male, this is the way that they're presenting. So I use the word queer to describe myself because I don't always feel like that. So there's new ways of defining our sexuality and our gender that are always coming up and it brings into deep questioning the um, the ways that we think about gender and the way that gender is expressed within our society, right? So I think maybe we get caught up in words sometimes, right? Words have power too, yes. And so when I think about the word queer, I think about the ways that young people are empowered to think about this, to think about it and to, to, um, to define themselves in, in a way that, that might be out of what we thought before. And so when we think about, so to your second point, um, I, I don't know much about percentages of who identifies at what. I think well, what, there's like a one in four people is queer, right? Is that the statistic? One in Gosh, I wish I knew that off the top of my head. Oh, there's another camera here. Um, so there's, there's um, I don't know of that. Um, I don't know about overpopulation either. I don't know much about that. But when we're thinking about um, LGBTQ people and their inclusion with, um, within our society, it's important to remember that like some queer people also there's like surrogacy, you know, there's, there's options for people to still have families and adoption and all of these things. And so like families look different than the way that we might have thought about them before. And I have friends, we've, my husband and I have decided not to have children. We've gone through the adoption process, decided it was emotionally, too emotionally taxing for us, right? But we have friends who have adopted, we have friends who have done surrogacy. So, um, Families just look a little bit different than I, I remember in fifth grade. I was in the, the debate club and we were the, the question that we were supposed to reflect on was what is what will the family look like in the year 2020? And my little fifth grade mind could have never imagined that a family would look like my friends Mike and Ben's family, right? Mike and Ben who have an adopted son, who have a daughter by surrogacy. That family looks so different than what my little 12-year-old mind could have imagined. And we're beginning to see variances and differences in what families look like around gender, around race. Um, yeah. Good questions, though. <laughs> yeah.
That's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. Yeah, we're still learning. Yes, question here. Sorry, I'm just going to add, um, a, a queer is a term that some people embrace and some people do not. Um, it is very generational in many ways. Um, in the LGBTQ community, there is a lot of generational divide about whether that term is embraced or not. Um, but you also see it in academia, used an awful lot and used frequently as a verb because we are queering history and we are queering literature and we are looking through a different lens. Um, and that is a, a fascinating way of kind of adding to overall the way we're looking at things. And I think anybody who knows us knows that we've done our share to repopulate the planet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, any other, yeah, and, and like, yeah, queer, queering things, bringing things into question, right? That's like at the heart of it. And um, we, we talk in queer theology, bringing things into deep question so that we can build a theology that is inclusive. Shifting the lens, yes. Well, I think what's interesting is that this is so fluid, and um, my child thinks differently than I do, and, um, and in 20 years, another human being will think differently again. Uh, and I think it's important to um, just be open and listen to the younger generation and sort of adapt the things that you're locked into and how you think about it. But I'm curious about um, language and communication and what's be, how that makes its way into the media and how to change that sort of perspective from the media. Because you're constantly bombarded from the media in all of the perceptions around this. Yeah, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, there's whole studies around misinformation and the ways that it affects certain people more than others, right? It, it's a cultural shift. I want to go back to what you were saying before, though. When I talk about queerness and specifically queerness in like churches or like learning what this all means, I said, like I said before, it's all about relationships. I think it's important to center the relationships with people. Seeing, knowing queer people makes a difference. Right in, in, in the ways that we think about um, trans rights, in the ways that we think about marriage equality, just these are, or the ways that, that young people develop. Um, so yes, relationships. And so we need to begin to change hearts and minds too, right? It's, it's um, I think that's important along with the policy and change. And we hope we see a lot of misinformation out there and it's about dispelling some of the misinformation, but not just dispelling it, supplanting it with correct, with actual information. Question from a Zoomer. Thank you. Um, actually, it's from me. Um, since you admitted a preference for the Oxford comma at the top, we are accepting that you are, in fact, a grammar nerd, as many of us are. Um, could you explain then the use of the they, them pronouns, which some people struggle with? Yes, I can explain a little bit. Um, we use a singular they all the time. So let's say we're driving down 35W, right? And we're just going along and somebody zooms past us, right? And they're like, oh my gosh, that person's driving like they're a bat out of hell, right? You used a singular they. Because as far as I know, Two people aren't driving a car. Good God, I hope not, right? You use a singular they all the time. And so they has been used throughout grammar history as a way to describe somebody. And we use it all the time. It just takes some practice, right? We use a singular they constantly. And you don't say they is, right? We don't use they is or they was, right? They were, they are. Just follow the grammar rules that still, those still apply when we're, because that's clunky. That's, yeah, silly if we did that. <laughs> so like when I say he or they, I'm not expecting you to use he at a certain time and they at a certain time. I'm just saying, mix it up, change it around. I'm comfortable with both, have fun with it. I know I do, right? So use it interchangeably. 
We're not asking for gymnastics, right? We're, not ask, we're just asking to be used by pronouns that we identify with. Great question, thank you. Any other questions? I want to be respectful of time too, so. Yeah. Chiming in here. Um, I want to just tell people if you're not comfortable or if it's kind of confusing, all of the language, all the terms are confusing. The most important thing, as you were just saying, is the relationship. Ask. Ask people what terms they prefer, what pronouns they prefer, what works for them. You don't have to decide for a whole large group of people what, what term works for you or what term you want to, just ask, because we're all different. You know, we all have different ideas about it. Yeah, it's about being in relationship, asking good questions. All right, one more. I think one of the most devastating thing that's happening now is the dehumanization of many groups of people, including, including LGBTQ. Um, once you dehumanize someone, then we hear the following words out of, uh, I don't remember what state Congress said, uh, we need to execute all trans people, actually use those words, is because they are dehumanized and they don't matter. So I think that's just a key thing to think about, it's same as in, think about relationships, the people that you're with, the care you have for them, I hope, um, but stop dehumanizing whoever the person is and value them um, as a person of God and, and faith, so. Yeah, I think at the heart of it is empathy, right? Understanding empathy, so thank you. Leaning into empathy, leaning into um, the questions and remembering that we're all human beings on a journey. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. If you need anything, reach out to me. Um, my last name is terrible, but my first name is fine. So it's matt at outfront.org. Matt at outfront.org if you need anything, anything. So thank you so much, I appreciate it. Thank you, Matt. And thanks to all of you for coming. Thanks to all of you for coming. And pay attention to your chronicle because there's follow-up but it might be a little different than we had imagined. So we need a little time <laughs> to figure out what the next step is. If you have feedback for us about that, if you're sitting here thinking, okay, I know what they should do next, please be in touch. You can find my email in the, what's the thing that has names in it? Breeze, <laughs> Breeze. <laughs> um, and don't, don't hesitate to reach out to me or anybody else that you know is in the group, uh, or to Pastor Cindy, I would say. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Matt. Have a safe day.